right, so let's uh, let's get started. We left off. We're we're in Second Samuel chapter five, and we we left off with verse seventeen, and we just to re you know re review what we've done so far. We saw in uh, in uh, chapter four. Um, we saw a process we've seen in the last few chapters, a process of David trying to consolidate his reign. And in chapter five, we have a real beginning where until now there's like their civil war and David is the king in Hebron of Judea and Saul's family, okay? Abner and Ishbosheth, they're reigning the rest of the tribes uh, in the north. But in chapter five, all of the tribes of Israel come to Hebron to crown David king of all of Israel. And then um, soon afterwards, we read that then they capture Jerusalem. Okay, so we left off right after the capturing of Jerusalem. And then we have a few verses here. Um, two things that we're interested in. In verse 11 and 12, we learn that the king of Tyre builds David a palace and that says something to David. He understands that God is with him. And then we have a little bit of a summary of things, not just that happened until now, but including later that he ha had sons and daughters and who they were and includes uh, here Solomon. And we know for a fact that Solomon is, is born much later, but it's like a summary chapter, uh, summary few verses. So now we come to, to uh, verse uh, 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, the Philistines marched up in search of David. But David heard of it, and he went down to the fortress, which is the fortress. We, we know before that when he um, uh, captured, we know in verse 7, okay, that David captured the stronghold of Zion. It is now the city of David. And so he's sitting in this fortress in Zion, on Mount Zion or near Zion or whatever, okay, uh, he has captured Jerusalem, and that is where he's sitting, and there is also some kind of a stronghold there. Uh, also, we know that Jerusalem is a natural, it's up on hills, and it's naturally protected. So he's there, safe and sound, in Jerusalem, and um, David hears that this is going on, so he goes to that fortress, okay, to, to Zion. Now, why? What? What's going on? Like, let's recall a few things that will be the background here for the Philistines. Why are they? Why are they suddenly uh, wanting to start battle? What is their background? So, if, so a few things just to re remember. First of all, the Philistines. Um, <coughs> some of you have been studying with me since the Book of Joshua. We went through all of Joshua, went through all of Judges, and went through First Samuel, now and Second Samuel. So if you recall, or those of you who just know this, already the book of Judges is when we first see the Philistines. And starting somewhere in the middle of Judges, we start seeing them as an ongoing problem. And we saw that as well as 1 Samuel. And in fact, it is in battle with the Philistines that Saul and Jonathan are killed. So the Philistines are a problem. And at the end of that war, we know that Saul and Jonathan are killed. And it is the end of that war that David starts consolidating his reign. We don't hear about any further, in, the, in those series of stories, we don't hear about any further problems with the Philistines. But on the other hand, the Philistines won that war, okay, with, with, with Saul, and they killed Saul and Jonathan. Um, so we it's kind of left open. We don't know exactly what is our situation with, with the Philistines. So in a sense, you could say this is a direct continuation, okay? A few years have passed. We know that David was king in Hebron for seven years, and he has just now uh, conquered Jerusalem. So maybe eight years have passed, nine years have passed, okay? But we have not learned of anything that says we have solved our problem with the Philistines. And in general, throughout this period and going back for quite some time, possibly hundreds of years, the Philistines are problems that don't ever really go away. There's, there's times of greater issues, times of lesser issues, but they're an ongoing thorn in the sight of the, of the Israelites. So that's an important background. But there's a much more specific background. You'll recall that in the course of David fleeing from Saul, he ends up going to Tziklag, and he finds refuge with one of the princes of the Philistines. 
And at that time, he convinces this prince of, his name is Achish, he convinces him that he's on his side. And Achish knows that Saul, king of Israel, is chasing David. So it is his assumption, the king, Achish's assumption, that, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So his assumption is because Saul is chasing after David and the Philistines and Saul are at war, then David is his ally. And indeed, he is asking David to go and, and uh, go on raids and, and help him defeat some of the local enemies. And he, he's expecting him to go and attack Judea. And David does not want to attack Judea. So he keeps attacking uh, Amalek and some of these other people in the area and brings back the spoils and lets uh, Achish believe that he's been attacking Judea when actually he doesn't want to attack Judea because he's loyal to his people. Okay, when does that all blow up, literally blows up, uh, at the point at which, uh, luckily for, um, I mean, luckily for uh, uh, David, he, you know, Achish says, come, that battle that Achish is going up to fight against Saul, where Saul's killed, he wants David to join him. And David is in a terrible position, he doesn't know what to do. But luckily, fortunately, Achish is convinced by the other uh, Philistine princes, you know what? Tell David to go back home. And he does. He tells him to go back home. Now, realizing before he knows it, so he kills Saul and everything is great. What happens? David becomes king of Israel. And so it becomes crystal clear to the Philistines that he was never on their side. Okay. And he, then he goes, if you recall, and he, they, they tack up Saul's head on the walls of Beit Shad, right? Which at the time is a Canaanite city. And they bring him down and they bury him. And and then David is the king. And, and so initially he could say, OK, it, not so aware of internal politics, or maybe he is, you know, these Philistine kings. OK, so David is king of Hebron, this king of Judea. They can tolerate that. OK, all right. It's his little tribe. It's his kinsmen. Fine. But he's not. There's still a civil war going on. So he has that assumption. My enemies. Uh, enemy is my friend, right? So for as long as there's a war going on between Ishboshet and Abner on one side on behalf of the Saul family and David on the other side, so he says, okay, I can still have an ally alliance with David and nothing much goes on. And it, you can assume the Philistines sit back and say, similar to what Abner said, you know, let the boys play it out. The Philistines are sitting back and watching the two sides go at each other, the Judeans versus the, you know, the rest of Israel. Okay, what happens now? Now, all of a sudden, all that comes to an end. Ishbosheth is dead. Abner is dead. And uh, David becomes king of all of Israel. And it is at that point that they realize, literally, David was never their friend. It was, you know, and, and so you can see when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, this becomes a point where they say, aha, you know, we're never going to ally with David. He's taken over the whole kit and caboodle. He's loyal to the Israelites. He is not interested in the Philistines. And so they take advantage of this opportunity and they go and they come to attack. So where do they go? This is verse 18. The Philistines came and spread out over the valley of Rephaim. Now, in Hebrew, this is Emek Rephaim. Some of you who have been to Jerusalem may uh, remember the street. There's a major street in Jerusalem called Emek Rifaim. And it's called Emek Rifaim because it's in Emek Rifaim. That is the Valley of Rifaim. Okay. Now, um, that that is not really only a valley. In Israel, you know, you probably know the term a nachal or a wadi. These are more like riverbeds, okay? Except being in the Middle East, when we don't have very much water, our riverbeds are always dry. So that is what this is. There's something called Nacha Rifaim or Emek Rifaim. And this place in Jerusalem, it's actually a valley, but it connects to like a river that's a dry river that leads to the West. So what the Philistines center, are always centered in the West, uh, but we know that, like, for example, when they defeated Saul and Jonathan, they went all the way north. They were in the Galilee. They were in the Gilboa, okay? And the way they cut across, they always cut across through some kind of a riverbed of this type. So they come up from the west. Picture they're coming up, let's say, from Gaza, or they're coming up from the area that's today Tel Aviv, and they're going to go across to, to Jerusalem. Now, some of you may have seen this. in uh, At the end of Amek Rifaim, 
are old railway tracks. Today, there's an area that is just off of, um, how do I describe this? Just off of, of Derach Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Road. Um, and they made this whole uh, commercial shopping area out of it. It's an area that used to have, it's between Der Hebron Road and Bethle Bethlehem Road in the center of Jerusalem, right opposite the old city, right opposite Mount Zion. There's an area there, there's this old train station. Okay, and today they took it and they have a whole shopping center. They have the original building and they have these train tracks. And those train tracks continue from there to Amit Rifaim Street and that area. Okay, now there's no train there anymore. Today the trains go differently. This is a train goes back to the time of the British Empire. But why I'm telling you this, there was an old train, actually, I think even started in the Ottoman Empire, a train that went from Jaffa to Jerusalem through the Valley of Rifaim. So you can see that if the train went through there, because why, what do you need to do? You need to get from the coast, which is at sea level, up on top to Jerusalem. So they're always going to find some kind of a, a path, a river or whatever that they could use. And so uh, whether it was in the Ottoman Empire times or here in David's time, this was the main, the easiest way, the main way for the Philistines to go up to Jerusalem. And it makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, the main road to Jerusalem today, Route 1, is a very steep road. If you drive on that road, you're going up, up, up in a very steep level. On the other hand, this area where the train used to go, the ancient train through that, is a much more gradual increase. And you're not going as high uh, in Jerusalem because that road over there is the lowest point in Jerusalem. Anyway, just to give you a bit of geography, so that's why they came there. They come there and they spread out throughout that valley. So David is across the way. Okay, they're south of David. David is to the north, up in his fortress on Mount Zion or near Mount Zion. Okay. And so at that point, David inquires of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? And the Lord answered David, go up and I will deliver the Philistines into your hands. Now, what does it mean when he inquires of the Lord? David actually inquires of the Lord on a few other occasions that you may remember. The first time was uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 23. And here, there's a situation, it's part of the time when um, David is fleeing from Saul. And if you recall, um, Eviatar, who was a priest in Nov, after Saul destroys the city of Nov and all the priests that are there. Um, Eviatar flees, manages to flee, and he takes the breastplate. He takes the, the breastplate that is used to inquire of God. It's also called the Ephod. He takes it with him. And so he joins David, and this is David's vehicle to ask God, what, what do I do? So the first time that happens is 1 Samuel chapter 23, uh, verse 9. And we say here, and David had learned that Saul was planning to harm him. He told the priest Eviatar to bring the ephod forward. And David said, O oh Lord, God of Israel, your servant has heard that Saul intends to come to Keilah and destroy the town because of me. Will the citizens of Keilah deliver me into his hands? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? So, and he gets an answer. In other words, he's trying to figure out, should he, uh, should he go down to... Uh, Will, will Saul come down to chase him at Keilah? And if he remains there, will the people of Keilah give him up? And God says, yes, Saul will come down to Keilah. And indeed, the people of Keilah will betray you. And so therefore, he gets out of there. So that he that's the first time that we see he asks, uh, asking God what exactly to do. The second time was when he comes back to Tziklag. And this is 1 Samuel chapter 30. Chapter 30, uh, verse 7, I believe. Uh, yeah. Uh, David said to the priest, Eviatar, son of Ahimelech, it's always Eviatar who has this breastplate. He has to ask God using the breastplate, which is really controlled by the priest. Bring the ephod up to me. When Eviatar brought up the ephod to David, David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue those raiders? Will I overtake them? And he answered and pursued, for you shall overtake and you shall rescue. This is when he comes back to Tziklag after he had gone up part of the way with the Philistines, comes back and he finds 
that the women and children have all been taken captive and the city was burned to the ground. And he's not sure, should I go chase the Amalek? What should I do? And God says, yeah, go chase them and you will win. Okay, sounds good. Third time is just recently, just in chapter two, um, when right after uh, Jonathan and Saul are killed, and it's chapter two, uh, verse one, okay? Sometime afterward, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? The Lord answered, yes. David further asked, which one shall I go up to? And the Lord replied, to Hebron. And here the question is, basically, it is clear that at this point, it's David and Jonathan are dead. David is being handed the opportunity to be king. We don't yet know that Ishbosheth is going to take over the north. But certainly David has the ability right now to fulfill that original anointing. Samuel anointed him in the name of God. And, and, and so he's basically saying, okay, God, should I do something now to take possession of this kingdom that you anointed me for? It's a very, very legitimate question because God may say to him, you know, maybe wait a bit. We'll see how this all plays out. But David, no, God says, no, go now and go to Hebron, which is how David gets to Hebron and establishes his first kingdom there. And this based upon asking um, God. There's one place, though, that I'm actually quite surprised uh, that he does not ask. And that is just in the story at the beginning of this chapter, when they go to uh, to capture Jerusalem. Now, what do we learn? Uh, in, in verse 3, he is anointed king of Israel. Then we learn in verses 4 and 5 how long he'd been in Hebron, and then he goes to Jerusalem. And then the next thing we know in verse 6, he goes, sets out, starts a war against the Jebusites. He actually approaches them first and says, you know, give me the city. This is a city that ostensibly should have been captured before. We know both in Joshua and in Judges, it's a city that they did not capture. There's, a, there's an implied criticism there that they didn't finish the job. Okay, but um, he, he, why didn't he ask God? I mean, this is a question that to me is like, that's to start a war, a war that nobody's provoking. The Jebusites have not come at him for war. He's sitting pretty at Hebron. He could have just said, okay, I'm not king over Hebron. The new capital of Israel is in Hebron. So there are people who answer the, not exactly that question, but they'll say, well, why, why did he go need Jerusalem? Like, what was the point? And one of the things, two, two things that they mention. One is that Jerusalem, and I think we mentioned this already, Jerusalem actually is a city that is, straddles two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. And it's the Temple Mount that is at the border of the two tribes. Benjamin is to the north, and uh, Judah's to the south. So um, there's a sense there that just as David is becoming king of all over Israel, it is particularly important that he unify these two most problematic tribes. Judah is his tribe, his family, where he's already very comfortable and confident being king there. But Benjamin is Saul's tribe. And so if he can join those two tribes, that can become the key to joining the entire kingdom, even though he's already been crowned. So you crown him, and you know how it is. You crown king, but if your people are not really united, then the stability of your reign is not ensured. But if you can bring together the two most critical problematic tribes, that could be the key to keeping the whole nation united. And that makes a lot of sense uh, as to the importance to take an initiative and go and conquer Jerusalem. Um, another thing that people mention is, and I think this is probably more significant, I would say in a spiritual way, we know that Abraham, uh, went to Mount Moriah at God's command to sacrifice, or didn't really, but, you know, the binding of Isaac, he was commanded by God to take him to Mount Moriah. And we know Mount Moriah is the temple mount. It was very possible then that David understood from a spiritual point of view that the center of his kingdom has to be there. But this is indeed a holy city. And we see later on, and we're going to 
next week's lesson, we're going to start studying the process of David moving the ark to Jerusalem, and that becomes a problematic process. But again, it's something he wants to do. The ark has been, if you just recall the history of where the ark was, the ark had been captured by the Philistines, and then they got it back, and then it went to a few different places, and it's sitting in a family in Kiryat Yarim, which is uh, just west of Jerusalem, okay? So, and it's in, a, it's in, it's in Benjamin, actually. It's west and north of what's the uh, ancient Jerusalem, city of David, etc. cetera. So um, that's where it's sitting. So if you see it, then the next thing he does after he captures Jerusalem, in the middle, we have the Philistine war. But from the Jerusalem point of view, we know that if he already understood that he has to bring the ark to Jerusalem, it could also be that he understood that it's Jerusalem, that's that key city. And therefore, from both from a spiritual point of view and from a um, national, you know, political point of view. And therefore, it's possible that he doesn't ask, and I can throw this out to you in case you have any other suggestions, because I did not see this question posed in this way. Why didn't he ask God specifically, should I go up to Jerusalem and conquer Jerusalem? Should I go up against the Jebusites and conquer? He doesn't ask him. And I've checked in Chronicles and he doesn't ask him there either. So the only thing I can think of is that he already has this understanding based on tradition, perhaps based on a previous revelation or based just on his spiritual understanding that Jerusalem is going to be the spiritual center of Israel, and therefore he doesn't need to ask God because he knows that's part of his job. He understands the importance of Jerusalem. But if any of you have other suggestions, happy to hear it. Think about it. Maybe we'll talk about it at the end if anybody has any comments. All right, anyway, so that's that's just a question. So now when we're in, uh, in verse 17 and we see... Uh, it makes sense, though, in a way that he will ask about the Philistines. On the other hand, I would think it's less likely that he should ask about the Philistines, because if you understand the geography, basically the Philistines have just come up against David. They initiated the war, not David, and they're coming up against Jerusalem. They're in the valley just below Jerusalem, but they're clearly coming towards Jerusalem. So it's interesting that he asks God permission, should I go up against the Philistines? But really the second question is the more important one. Will you deliver them into my hands? Okay, and I think that is really the gist of it. There's no question from a practical point of view, the king should go up against the Philistines because he, they are marching on his capital. Okay, they're on their way to his fortress. They're marching on the capital. And so basically what David wants to know is not just does it make sense for me to fight? Of course it makes sense to me to fight. But what he wants to know is, will, will God be with me so that I will succeed in this fight? And then, of course, you know, makes perfect sense. But God answers him. Uh, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? And the Lord answered David, go up and I will deliver the Philistines in your hands. Thereupon David marched to Baal Pratim. And David defeated them there. Now, we do not know where Baal Pratim is. It could be some hill somewhere near Jerusalem, near Emek Rephaim. We don't really know. But we learned that actually the name, when he went there, it wasn't called Baal Pratim because we're now going to learn that the name is something that David gives to the place based upon what happened there. And David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me as waters break through a dam. Now, the word pratsim means breakthrough. So he's calling the place based upon, it's it's kind of like saying, Baal pratsim is like the lords of the of the breakthrough or something like that. And, and makes sense because what is he talking about? He's talking about the Lord God helped him in this defeat, okay, by helping him break through to his enemies. That is why that place was named Baal Pratsim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Now, there are interpretations that talk about when it says here, broken through my enemies before me as waters break through a dam, that it's not just a metaphor, but that's exactly what happened. That God wrought a miracle, and there was this suddenly um, trembling of the earth, 
and water gushed through, that it wasn't just David's army, but there was the supernatural event of water breaking through a dam that just kind of uh, took them by surprise. The Philistines, they were frightened and they ran away because that is what happened. They abandoned their idols there and they ran away. And then we see, and David and his men carried them off. Now the word in Hebrew in verse 21 for carried them off is vayisa'en, okay? And that is indeed the right translation for just carried them off. But there are people that say, wait one second, carry them off? What kind of thing is that? That David is suddenly going to carry off the idols? You're not supposed to carry off the idols. You're, what, what is a good Israelite who believes in God doing taking idols? Okay. So first of all, let's take a look at uh, Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 14. This is where it, you know that uh, first, the Chronicles repeat a lot of the stories that we're reading in the book of Samuel, and sometimes they have interesting differences. So here's one example. Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 14, uh, verse, verse um, 12, okay? Well, what does it say there? Uh, they, uh, they left there their idols, talking about the Philistines, and David said, let's burn them by fire, Okay. And there the word that's used is, wait, let me, I was reading, I was doing my own translation. Let me just uh, read what the translation is here in the English translation that I have. Uh, 14, here we go. Uh, they abandoned their gods there and David ordered these to be burned. It's the same story, okay? Now, it's interesting though, that then as a result of what's written in First Chronicles, they come back to the verse here and they understand there's a word in Hebrew called masu'a, okay? Masu'a, the same root as what's here, vayisa'em, the same root as masu'a, and that a masu'a is a bonfire. And indeed, this verb is, is can also be interpreted not just to mean uh, carry them off, but to burn them. And so it's it's likely that when it says here that this translation is actually wrong, that it's not that David carried them off, but that he burned them. Okay? He and his men burned the idols. And why does that make a lot more sense? Because if you take a look at Deuteronomy 7, I'm doing a bit of a hiking around the Bible today, okay? Deuteronomy 7, verse 25. What does God tell us in the most specific ways? You shall consign the images of their gods to the fire. You shall not cover the silver and gold on them and keep it for yourselves, lest you be ensnared thereby, for that is abhorrent to the Lord your God. David is a God-fearing man. He is not going to carry off these idols, okay? So he's going to burn them. Then there are people that said he did both and that the use of this word to carry them off and also mean to burn is a double meaning. What's the significance of carrying them off? And here I think is very interesting because you have to get into the head of the Philistines. And if David is the king of Israel is going to defeat the Philistines, one of the things he's going to want to do is not just defeat them so he could say, you see, I won this battle. But he wants to create a level of deterrence so that they don't want to fight again. And therefore, he is going to do something that in the Philistine mentality is the ultimate expression of defeating your enemy. When the Philistines came upon Shiloh and they burnt Shiloh to the ground, what did they do? They took the ark. Even before they got to Shiloh, they actually defeated the nation at the battles of Eben, uh, uh, Ebenezer and okay and they defeated them there and what did he do they took the ark with them now they could have burnt the ark they could have abandoned the ark they didn't believe in the ark right it wasn't their god but they took the god the ark off and put it in their temple of Dagon and it seems this was at that time, either in Philistine culture or in the ancient culture in general, when you defeated your enemy, one of the most powerful expressions of that defeat is to take their idol and carry it off and put it in your temple, okay? 
So he, David is not going to take the idol and put it in the temple. He doesn't have a temple at this point, but certainly he is not going to treat it in any way to put it anywhere near something that is holy. But the idea of carrying it off is a way of expressing to the enemy. You see, I didn't just defeat you militarily, but I took your idols. I have power over your idols. I took them, but he took them and then he burns them. Okay, so I think that's that's a very interesting way of seeing it. All right, now we have another Philistine battle. Okay, he was he did a good job. He defeated them. He created some level of deterrence, but they were not deterred enough because they came and tried again. Once again, the Philistines marched up and spread out over the valley of Rephaim to come back to the same place again. David inquired of the Lord, and he answered. So again, David says, well, do I fight him again? And again, what does he really want to know? Will he succeed? And here, the God answers them in a completely different way. He doesn't say yes or no. He gives them military strategic advice. He says, David inquired the Lord, and he answered, do not go up, but circle around behind them and confront them at the Baca trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the Baca trees, then go into action, for the Lord will be going in front of you to attack the Philistine forces. David did as the Lord had commanded him, and he routed the Philistines from Geva all the way to Gezer. So first of all, what is this idea? It reminds us of the second time that under Joshua, they captured the AI. And if you remember the first time they captured the AI, they just went straight in and there were a lot of problems there and they failed, okay? And then, and part of it was due to sin. And those of you who studied Joshua with him, we had a whole analysis of this whole thing. But suffice it to say that one of the problems the, of the nation of Israel that was reflected by the sin there of taking from the, the, the goods that were not, the spoils that were not supposed to be taken, was that there was a sense of arrogance, a sense of, I won this war, the spoils are mine, I'm great, okay? And that was reflected also in the way they handled the battle with the AI in the first time. They had no military strategy. They just went up against them and thought they could win because God is with us and he broke down the walls of Jericho and it's all us and everything is great. The second time when they learned their lesson, it's a lesson that it's a lesson of, uh, you know, humility, okay? To realize not just that God is on your side, but you also have to work at it. You can't just assume that God's going to rain down miracles like he did in Jericho. You got to do something. And then you suddenly see strategy. Joshua divides the camp, sends half the army to go around the back and surprise them from the back and then close in on the front. So this is a very similar thing that he did. God says, go around the back, surprise them from the back. Don't go head on, come from the back. There's also an interpretation that says what they were essentially doing is going from the back, which would mean that when the Philistines would have to face them, they would be facing west, which means they would have the sun in their eyes. Because it would be, you know, in the afternoon, they start the, the surrounding in the morning. By the time they have the battle, it's the afternoon and the sun is in their eyes. Either way, it is a brilliant strategy. And I think it's very interesting that God here doesn't just say yes or no, but he gives them a strategy. And that's also, I think, a very important lesson, similar to the lesson in the AI. Yes, you have to feel that God is with you. And we see that in David. He doesn't need that lesson. He knows that he has to rely on God and he has to ask God. And he, you know, it's God is giving him the victory and the blessing and all that. And that's very, very clear, especially in chapter five. But uh, I think we also see that that um, David here. It, you know, that the God is giving him advice on, on, on how to do this, saying to him, it's not enough that you sit back and wait for the miracles. You have to do it right. You have to think yourself. You've got to do it in the right way. And coming together like that, the strategy, human strategy, in this case, prompted by God's instruction, but he's teaching him. You need human strategy together with God on your side, winning combination. And the end of this is that he de totally defeats the Philistines from Geva, which is in Benjamin, north of Jerusalem, until Gezer. I don't know if any of you have been to the archaeological ruins of Gezer. Gezer was a huge Canaanite fortified city south of Jerusalem, southwest of Jerusalem, in between Ramla and Beit Shemesh of today. Okay. And, and that makes a lot of that area is much closer to the Philistines. If you remember the story of Samson in the book of Judges, Samson is near Beit Shemesh and he goes all the way west to Gaza. And this area of Gezer is right in between. 
in between Gaza and Beit Shemesh. So that we know was a natural hangout of the Philistines all the way back from the beginning. And so if he routes them up to there, he's totally gotten rid of them. Now we do know that the Philistines remain um, in the land along the coastal areas, but they never again after this point become a threat to Israel in any way. They are totally and finally military defeated at this point. And that's the end of chapter five. Any questions? No questions, but a comment on Jerusalem. I think it's inconceivable that David didn't know about the spiritual importance of Jerusalem to, to everything. Um, as a king of Israel, he would look back on a much earlier king and on somebody who'd had fellowship with God, the bread and the wine. And, Melchizedek. Yes. And where Abraham had learned that God was with him in all his battles. So I think all the way along, he and probably others as well would realize the importance of Jerusalem, even if they didn't have any opportunity of getting at it uh, until, well, until they took their opportunity and Joab went up and, uh, and took the citadel. Um, apparently, through the valleys of Jerusalem, form the letter Sheen, which of course is Shalom or Sa uh, Salem as Salem. well. Yes. Um, I'd like to commend to all of you a site called Israel My Channel on YouTube, and particularly something that was put up this week about Jerusalem from its early beginnings. And it, it just shows the topography and uh, it's put, it builds it up bit by bit. And you can see the tower where probably David sat. And you could see how they enclose all the various water sources and how Hezekiah shoves through another tunnel. And it's quite fascinating. So Israel- Oh, wow, sounds channel. wonderful. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, Carol. That's great. No, I agree with you. I think that was- Basically, you're reinforcing what I'm saying, that he didn't have to ask God because he understood that there was a spiritual significance to Jerusalem. It wasn't just conquering a city to make a capital somewhere, you know. So, yes. Any other comments? Um, yes. yes, Lynn. Uh, you just mentioned about Sheen. I can't pronounce the word. A chap called Steve Maltz has written a whole book about that, and it's interesting. But in my Bible, verse 24 says you will hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees. The interesting bit with the mulberry trees is that unlike other trees, when the trees blow backwards and forwards, other trees make a sound, but the mulberry trees don't make a sound. There's, oh. As the wind blows them, it's quite, it's apparently, so I'm told, the mulberry trees are quiet. And that was absolutely, to hear a sound had to be God, didn't it? Wow, that's great, because here it just doesn't translate the baka. They say it's baka, so I don't even know that it's a mulberry tree, but that's great that your Bible's identified. Oh, oh, we have different one. words for different trees, obviously, but that's what it says. And when you when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the right, mulberry right. trees. Right, so we have just the, the name of the tree here that in my English is called baka, which is the exact, it's just the transliteration of the Hebrew. Yeah. So I didn't even know it was a mulberry, but th that's wonderful. I think it's great. Sounds, yeah. sounds very brilliant. Oh, good, yeah. That's brilliant. He's the creator, yeah. isn't he? He can do anything. For sure. For sure. That's great. Anyone else? Okay. So it was wonderful seeing you all this week. And we will meet again next week and we'll start with chapter six, which of course starts with the whole story of bringing the ark up to Jerusalem. And we will probably spend uh, at least two classes on that, maybe more. That's quite a, that's a whole interesting story. Okay, have a good week, everybody. We'll see you next week.